welcome to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. My name is Glenn Taransky, and I'm a member of the advisory board here at One Business World. Leading Entrepreneurs of the World features entrepreneurs, founders, business leaders presenting on cutting edge topics and the latest industry developments. Today, we're very pleased to welcome global entrepreneur, scientist, and professor, Mark Tester, who is the co-founder and CSO of Red Sea Farms, an innovative agritech company based in Saudi Arabia. Mark, who is ranked in the top 1% of scientists globally, also holds the position of professor of plant science at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. In 2019, he was the head of the food sector at Naom. Prior to joining Kaus in February of 2013, he was an ARC Federation fellow and professor of plant physiology at the University of Adelaide where he established the Plant Accelerator. Previously, he was a senior lecturer at the University of Cambridge, where he also received his PhD in 1988. Mark's passion is to constantly develop and innovate saltwater-based agricultural systems to support global food security. At Red Sea Farms, Mark and his team deliver smart and environmentally sustainable, innovative agriculture systems to produce organic, pesticide-free, premium and delicious vegetables. For those of you that have seen his website, the tomatoes are phenomenal. Red Sea Farms came together with the joint mission of global food security to positively impact numerous food insecure regions of the world, financially, environmentally, and nutritionally. With innovation driving his mission, Red Sea Farms company and technology has been recognized with multiple awards such as the Food Tech Challenge Award in 2020, as well as uh, being a finalist in the Entrepreneurial World Cup in 2019. Red Sea Farmers is reducing the carbon and water footprint of our food sector by developing and delivering environmentally sustainable saltwater-based agricultural systems. The company's vision is to develop these technologies that enable economically viable food production in water-scarce communities around the world giving people more access to healthy, delicious, and locally grown produce. Red Sea Farms technology enables farmers to grow food in cool greenhouses using salt water and smart tech enabled systems while saving fresh water and energy. Mark, it is uh, our tremendous pleasure to have you here with us today. We look forward to hearing about your company, your, your, your story and your technology, and we welcome you to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World here at One Business World. Thank you very much, Glenn, for that um, fabulous introduction. You've um, summarized our company better than I think I could, so <laughs> I appreciate that very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank One Business World for the opportunity to um, introduce some of the activities that we're doing and perhaps even more importantly, the drivers behind it and why uh, just a an old professor like me decided to uh, go into um, an entrepreneurial activity. In fact, it's a very exciting and I suspect impactful way to try to deliver the outcomes of, um, of a lifetime's research. So I commend it to anybody in the audience who's thinking of uh, wanting to really make an impact. So what we're trying to do um, is, um, is address some environmental problems that are related to the production of our food. Food is essential for our everyday life. It is um, one of the basic human rights that have been recognized uh, by the United Nations in particular, for example, uh, for many, many decades. And it's more than that. It's also a central, it plays a central place in our culture. It's related to community, livability. Food brings people together, and that's very important. However, there are very significant challenges to our food systems, in particular, the sustainability of our food production. At the moment, arguably, the food sector, the food and agriculture sector, is arguably one of the most environmentally impactful of all human activities. It uses half of all the land that humans use. It uses two thirds to three quarters of all the water, of all the fresh water that humans use by far and away, most of this is used for agriculture and bringing food to our table. And 
depending on how you slice the, uh, the cake, the, uh, the, the activities of humans, it's the second or third biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. About 30% it is estimated of all greenhouse gas emissions, so global warming contributions comes from agricultural activity. And many of you might think about fertilizers and transport, but it's also related to methane emissions, methane emissions from cattle and methane emissions from growing rice in flooded paddy fields in particular in South and East Asia. Laid upon this is that globally, there is a very strong pressure to greatly increase their food production. This is partly driven by population um, increase and also driven by the fact that the world is getting wealthier and as people get wealthier, they eat more meat and meat has got a very much greater environmental footprint than plant-based products. And as people get wealthier, their per capita footprint of food consumption goes up quite substantially. And laid upon all of that is the fact that our food supply chains are very wasteful. Um, one third, it is estimated that one third of all food produced by the primary producers is either lost or wasted, lost prior to consumer purchase or wasted after consumer purchase. And this is a very large, um, huge impact on our, on our food system. The other challenge to the food system is related to human health. We now have more of the world's population living in countries where obesity is a bigger killer than undernourishment. And that has a huge cost um, economically as well as of course, socially. In a mirror image to the obesity related health problems, uh, problems of malnutrition. I'm not talking about insufficient calories. On average, the planet is doing very well in providing sufficient calories, sufficient energy, even sufficient protein. But there are many millions of people, in fact, it is estimated that 2 billion, primarily women and children, go to bed each night with insufficient micronutrients nutrition. We're talking about iron, zinc, vitamin A. These fundamental nutrients which are essential for human growth and development and well-being uh, um, in, taken at insufficient levels by a very large number of people. Um, this has enormous, of course, social and um, financial costs as well. So we need to address these challenges. And to address these, we've known of these problems for many, many decades, and we've been trying to address them. But to really make substantial headway now what we need is innovation. We need serious innovation. And I'm an optimist. I'm very realistic and analytical about the challenges that we have, but I'm not depressed by them because we have amazing opportunities now to really address these challenges because of technologies which are being developed at stunning speed at the moment. These technologies are both in the digital space and in the biotechnological space. So we've got opportunities to use blockchain, machine learning, computer vision, sensors, IoT, robotics, to improve the efficiencies of our production, to try to inform producers and consumers and policymakers by providing <clears throat> huge amounts of data. And we also have an opportunity to reduce loss and waste within the food supply chains using these digital technologies. And we also have biotechnology um, innovations. I'm not just talking about genetic modification or genome editing, although those are very powerful, but there's still issues around acceptance by the uh, wider public. But there are other technologies as well, genomics, genomic selection, our ability to phenotype, to characterize plants and the way they respond to the environment through their life cycle using computer vision, using drones, carrying all sorts of remarkable digital cameras. We've also got on the, on the, on the meat production side opportunities for quite revolutionary changes, exploiting technologies related to stem cells and continuous flow fermentation, which is very popular now because that's what's a technology producing the vaccines that are going to hopefully change our world for the better in the next three months or so. 
we can rely, we can start to deploy these types of technologies to accelerate the genetic improvement of our crops, to bring new crops into the food production systems because we can go out and get wild plants now and domesticate them, having new crops brought into systems. And those plants can have a whole range of favorable characteristics that are been lost in our current mainstream crops, such as maize, rice, and wheat. Fish farming is another highly impactful and extremely important um, area in the food production, but we need to feed fish and we need to be able to feed fish better and have more sustainable fish feedstocks. Technologies, biotechnologies can make an impact in that area as well. Okay, so we have serious challenges, but we also have serious opportunities. So I am ultimately an optimist. You might want to call me a techno-optimist. I would hope that I'm thinking at a system level as well. The technologies, I think, are not only um, achievable, but also deployable and socially acceptable. For this talk, I'd primarily like to focus on water and the challenges around water. I live in the Middle East, um, geographically really part of North Africa and the Great Sahara Desert, where there is serious water challenges, but serious water challenges don't just affect this region, they affect many, many areas of the world, perhaps most importantly, northern India and Pakistan, where a very large fraction of the world live, and where huge amounts of food production has occurred for 10,000 years, and it is now seriously unsustainable because of unsustainable exploitation of water. Globally, about one third of all the food we produce comes under irrigated systems. And as I said previously, two thirds of all water that humans use is used for agriculture. And remarkably, every groundwater source that is being used for this irrigation is being depleted. This is very well documented using NASA satellites and some fabulous work from the United States, documenting very clearly the depletion of all of the major aquifers being used for, um, um, for agricultural irrigation. So this means that a very large fraction of the food being produced globally is being produced exploiting unsustainably water reserves. So, for ex and this impacts the amounts of water, the depths from which the water is being pumped, and the quality of that water. So, for example, in Pakistan, which is a very rapidly growing country with a, a, very, a very impressive agricultural system centered around the Indus River, has 6 million hectares of land affected by salinity coming from unsustainable irrigation practices. And now they've got over two thirds of the wells in Pakistan are pumping brackish water. The water quality is declining and it is alarming. And these are serious issues that really do need to be addressed. However, we have a huge water resource that we might be able to learn to use, the water in the sea. 96% of all the water in the world is in the sea. For our human activities, three quarters, two thirds of which is used for agriculture in terms of water, that's only exploiting a fraction of 1% of the total water reserves on the planet. Wouldn't it be great if we were able to unlock, to gain access to the water that we're currently not using to provide our food security, in particular, the seawater? So if we can unlock seawater and other water, such as brackish groundwater that we currently cannot use using our current technologies to help feed the world, that really would be a fantastic, impactful breakthrough. And that's the product of my 35 years of, of research as a plant scientist and my business partner, his um, 15 years of um, research experience in agricultural engineering, we have come together to form this company to try to deliver the fruits of our research. We've called it Red Sea Farms. We're on the shores of the Red Sea here. We created this company to try to unlock the potential of seawater and other brackish water sources to support global food security. 
who see me in front of you as a plant scientist who spent most of my career understanding how some plants can tolerate salty water and salty soil better than other plants, understanding the physiological and molecular genetic basis of those. And now I'm trying to apply the fruits of that research. My co-founder, Ryan Lafers, is an agricultural engineer and he did his PhD as a mature man. So he had been a practicing agricultural engineer, consultant engineer for about seven years. And then he came back into uh, academic pursuits to do his PhD on how to cool greenhouses using salt water. And so our combined research experiences, about 50 years between us, um, is really the foundation for our company. We're in Kaus, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, um, a, a remarkable university uh, on the shores of the Red Sea, founded 12 years ago by King Abdullah at the time. He wanted to reinvigorate science and technology in the, in the Muslim world, in, uh, in Islam, because it has a very proud tradition, and this he wanted to reinvigorate. And so Kaust is a university where they're sponsoring, supporting high quality research and the delivery of that research. It is a commitment which has also been followed up. It's not just words. It has very good funding to enable the following up of these, um, of these fine words. And they have been backing our research since I arrived here eight years ago and Ryan arrived eight years ago as well, coincidentally. And uh, we were founded, we founded our company three years ago as a spin out of Kaos. We incorporated in Saudi Arabia two years ago. And uh, yes, we have a story that you've heard the background of, and uh, it's a sincere story. And uh, this is now really helping drive recruitment of good people into the company and the building of a, of a fairly substantial body of activity now. We, have, uh, we weren't just a finalist in the Entrepreneurship World Cup, we, um, we came third out of over 100,000 companies that submitted to that uh, particular competition. And uh, we were winners of, uh, yes, two other competitions. So we've, we have been, this is mostly last year, we have been getting some validation in that type of context. And uh, yes, we're using salt water and sunlight, I'll get to that in a minute, uh, to try to drive innovations in engineering and plant science. So our original aim was to establish a commercially viable system with a minimal environmental footprint that was economically viable, very, very important. So we're not just ideologues, we're realizing that if something is gonna be truly sustainable, it has to be not just environmentally sustainable, but also economically sustainable. And in that system, we were wanting to grow salt tolerant tomatoes using diluted seawater in a greenhouse, which was called cooled using straight seawater. And the roof was cleaned using no water, bringing in an innovation from another cast spin out company. And overall, the system, depending on the humidity time of year and so on, leads to about 80 to 95% of the total freshwater consumption in the greenhouse being substituted with seawater. So it's not 100% removal of the fresh water. We're taking a pragmatic decision to not go for 100%, but to go for, let's say, 90%. So we're still using 10% of the water in the greenhouses, still fresh water. But if we make that pragmatic compromise, this leads to the building of greenhouses where the capex is slightly higher than a normal greenhouse, but not much higher. The running costs are lower and you end up with a very small impact on the return on investment. So it becomes fairly rapidly economically viable. It is a lot easier for a farmer to make a decision to invest in purchasing our technology rather than just the normal off-the-shelf technology you get from the Netherlands or Spain or China. Since those early days, we have developed further We've actually um, merged with another company called Iris, uh, which uh, is developing organic photovoltaics. And these are tunable um, organic photovoltaics. And these have been tuned by the very clever woman who uh, co-founded that company, Daria Baran. 
They've tuned these photovoltaics so they absorb light in the infrared and are still completely or very nearly completely transmitting in the visible spectrum. So we can use these on the roof of the greenhouse. And so the greenhouse becomes uh, with reduced heat load and generating electricity. That's a bit of a win-win, certainly in this environment. So we're adding to our technology and engineering. So we're now developing these greenhouses with uh, low energy saltwater cooling. Another cooling that I'm going to describe a little bit more relate using liquid desiccants. We're catching humidity as the air egresses, leaves the greenhouse, which generates fresh water for reuse. And we've got that smart infrared absorbing glass. We have the plant science with the saltwater tolerant crops. And then we've also got another uh, venture, which we call Cortex, uh, which is using IoT and machine learning principles to uh, have the monitoring and control of the greenhouse and helping with decision making. And that decision making can be related to both environmental control and uh, the plant health. So it's monitoring things like pests and diseases. So we now have a technology stack, as we call it. I probably don't need to go through this too much detail at this stage, but suffice to say we have a series of, um, of technologies and each of these can be used independently. People can pick and mix from the different components that we have um, developed uh, to uh, control their cooling, control the, the light and energy management, and also to control the, the plants that they're growing. Good. We've very nearly completed the building of a pilot facility, which is um, on the Cal University campus. So uh, the, my office actually, my research laboratory is right there in the top right-hand corner. That's the main Cal campus going off for quite a large area of buildings around this bay. And then this here is the Innovation Park, which is providing land and support for, uh, for high-tech um, uh, spin-outs, as well as actually more established companies. So there's uh, Dow and um, Saudi Aramco have, uh, have substantial buildings, and Savic also has a substantial building on this site. And this is a 2,000 square meter pilot facility where every room is different. Uh, you've got different glasses because we've merged with this uh, glass company. This is the humidity capture system where the air is egressing the greenhouse. And along the back are a series of different types of evaporative cooling technologies to test and optimize the systems. So the idea of this greenhouse, there are four uh, rooms each at 500 square meters. So getting you know, near commercial scale rooms where we'll be able to parameterize our models optimize our technologies. We've still got a lot of optimization, I'm sure. It's already good. We can make something that's good better. And of course, develop new technologies. And that can be on both the engineering and the plant science side. And of course, this is a very useful building to be able to demonstrate our technologies to customers and investors. So what we're finding is that our greenhouse uses as its primary water input, seawater. Uh, I, I didn't point out in that image, um, there's the sea. <laughs> We're just a couple of hundred meters from the sea. Very, very easy to get large amounts of seawater. Um, and our freshwater consumption for the production of one kilogram of tomatoes is about 20 liters. And that compares to a normal greenhouse that's uh, in this region. And even in areas such as Arizona, where there's actually been some very good measurements done at the University of Arizona, normally in this hot, dry environment, we're talking about the use of 350 litres of water to produce one kilogram of tomatoes. That's like four large tomatoes. A small bag of tomatoes takes that much water. That's the reality. And we're able to reduce that by say a factor of 10 or so, probably a bit better than a factor of 10. So this is a very, very large decrease in the freshwater footprint. And really importantly, crucially importantly, is that we're doing this without any increase in energy consumption. There are methods of cooling greenhouses using mechanical 
cooling using refrigerator based cooling, which will have a very low water consumption, but it comes at a cost of very large energy consumption. And this is what's really nice. So you, we can talk about things like vertical farms and uh, how they're wonderful and don't use much water and don't use much land and so on, but I often fail to say that it has a very high energy consumption. And this is what's nice about our system is that we are greatly reducing the freshwater footprint, but not in the process, increasing our energy footprint. So by substituting freshwater with salt water, we're breaking what's known as the food water energy nexus. We need water for food. To get water, you need energy. And we're trying to break that food water energy nexus by substituting fresh water with salt water as much as makes sense, as much as is economically as well as technically feasible. The capex for our greenhouse is more than the capex of a, uh, of, of a normal cheap, if you like, um, standard greenhouse that people would build in the desert, uh, but the opex is significantly lower. So the ROI, the return on investment, is slightly longer, but not much longer. You know, maybe it goes, it depends on scale and so many other factors, but you know, roughly from maybe three, three and a half years to three and a half to four years type of return on investment. Okay. This is a summary of the, of the another summary of that stack of technologies that we're um, that we've built up inside Red Sea Farms over the past uh, couple of years, partly organically and partly by um, takeover of a company. But these technologies, as I say, can be can be mixed and matched depending on the particular challenges in the particular environment that the customer is facing, the farmer is facing. So we're able to address heat, of course, but also addressing excess humidity. And I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute using liquid desiccants. Of course, fresh water is a challenge in this whole region. And of course, that's one of the primary drivers for our, um, for our certainly our original technology development. There's a very interesting accidental, I'll have to confess, side benefit of cooling a greenhouse with seawater. It means you're sucking the air or pushing the air into the greenhouse through a wall of salt water. And this leads to um, the death of many insects and pathogens as they're coming into the greenhouse. So we are able to, um, because you know, the oceans cover 70% of the planet, they're a massive habitat Insects are the biggest, most diverse set of group of, um, of organisms on the planet, yet there are no insects that have adapted to live in the sea. It's a pretty remarkable observation. And um, we sort of went, we realized this as we were, as we were testing at a, at a small lab, or large lab, small scale, um, uh, earlier during Ryan's PhD. There's less pests and pathogens because the wall of seawater is actually killing quite a substantial fraction of the pests and pathogens that are coming into the greenhouse, which leads to a great increase in the quality of the fruit and the consistency of its production, which is a very happy accident. So we can do all this stuff and it's, it's nice. Um, is there really a market for it out there? I mean, no market, no company. Um, and of course, uh, food is is fundamental as i said actually in my very early preamble and um, people will always be needing to eat uh, it's a very very strong uh, market and of course a rapidly actually still rapidly growing market so what we need to really be focusing on is the fundamental drop need is there but what we need to do is make sustainability a business people have to want to buy into sustainability so that's why we have to minimize the capex, the extra capex drain on uh, potential customers. And I think we have three things which are really very positive and very valuable for farmers, which make them inclined to invest. We're reducing the input costs, so the opex in particular of our of our um, greenhouses is lower. And I think actually the OPEX might be even lower than we're estimating because of the impact of our saltwater cooling on pests and diseases. So farmers will be able to use much less chemicals, 
chemical control in their greenhouses. Um, we reduce risk for farmers because we're using a lot of solar energy and this is really very powerful for, um, for uh, reducing risk because farmers are often in a remote location where um, the energy, the electricity supply can be erratic. You only need the power off in this region for two hours and you've lost your crop as the greenhouse heats up through the roof. So that reduced risk is, is very important. And as I've already said, it increases the quality of the produce, uh, therefore the value, the monetary value of the produce. So our strategy is, of course, to develop the technologies, to demonstrate that technology is viable through, for example, the building of the pilot. And now we're starting to build a commercial scale greenhouse, a 10 hectare greenhouse, and then sell the produce. And if we can do that and show people that we're making money and that we're doing things which are much more environmentally sustainable, but still profitable, then people are much more inclined to, uh, to buy into this. And then we'll be ready to really scale through selling technology, where we are ultimately a technology company, but we can also scale through selling produce directly or under franchise or other business models. And the third dimension I haven't talked about is that we can actually sell seedlings, sell young plants, because our germplasm and some of the fruits of my research um, is starting to get quite valuable and impactful. And that would be mainly for growing plants in open fields where the field, the soil, and all the water is affected in particular by salinity. So this is another way of um, drawing out what I've just described. We've, uh, we've tested and developed um, research scale facilities. We've now just uh, pretty much finished a bridging, what we're calling a bridging round or pre-series A round, uh, where we're getting uh, reference facilities for uh, future customers and investors to, to see the reality of our, of our technologies. And after our Series A, which will be probably early next year, uh, we will be able to scale globally in these three areas of activity. I think I'm going to have to skip through these slides because I see I've already talked for 30 minutes and I don't think I should talk too much longer. Suffice to say, we have low energy salt water um, cooling, which is effective for most of the year, even in the fairly extreme environments that we have here in the Middle East. But we also have an ability, and this was developed during Ryan's PhD project, an ability to cool at night during the summer. Now in a lot of the tropics, the humidity can go up towards 100%. It's very uh, remarkable and it can still be very warm and too warm for the plants inside the greenhouse. So it's very important to be able to cool the greenhouse at night. People think about the blistering sun coming in and providing a heat load. That of course is a challenge. But in fact, I think a greater challenge is cooling at night. And what we've done is develop a system, what Ryan, I should say, did, um, is develop a system where using liquid desiccants, we can dehumidify the air and thus increase the ability to evaporatively cool the air, even when the bulk external air relative humidity is up towards 100%. So without Ryan's system, you simply cannot cool at night. And you can find yourself... You know, with an outside temperature still up around 30 degrees Celsius, that's like 85 degrees, 86 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And that's simply too warm for a plant at night. And so with Ryan's technology, we're able to cool down to temperatures which are much more favorable to enabling the ongoing high quality performance of crops. And this uses very, very little energy as well. And what energy it does, we can use solar energy. Speaking of solar energy, we have now merged with a company called um, Iris, which has, uh, as I said, got this organic solar technology for generating the glass, which is both blocking off heat and generating power. And associated with that sort of ult really ultimate, beautiful technology um, is uh, other technologies which are perhaps slightly less extreme innovative, but still extremely useful, such as using um, 
uh, LED-based lighting to not provide photons for photosynthesis, that just uses too much energy, but to provide, to manipulate the wavelengths and day lengths to optimize crop production. This can be particularly powerful for things like leafy greens. Uh, we're also using solar panels on the non-light transmitting parts of the, of the greenhouse and also using a heat blocking glass, just simply a non-power non, non, uh, generating, non-electricity non generating um, infrared heat blocking glass. That's already on our greenhouses and that reduces the energy requirement quite substantially. And then there's my own um, research outputs uh, from using salt tolerant tomatoes. We now have a range of different methods of developing uh, salt tolerant tomatoes. Uh, the most sophisticated is using um, grafting and developing salt tolerant rootstocks. And that work now is, um, is actually just, just being tested this season in the field in Egypt. Egypt being the world's number five producer of tomatoes most of which are grown in open fields, most of which are affected by salinity. We're also developing um, through my research programs, uh, other uh, products for um, open fields in particular, open fields. So the salt tolerant grain crops, salt tolerant fodder, um, as well as interestingly, an algal system, which can produce some high value products. These, these plants are all non-GMO. I'm a realist, I've used GM technologies in my time, uh, but for commercial uh, deployment, I'm not delusionary. And I know that the market will be requiring, demanding uh, GM-free products, but we do have unique salt tolerant tomatoes, uh, which have a very high quality uh, fruit produce, uh, fruit, um, very high quality fruits. The, Again, it's partly accidental, to be honest, but we're growing these plants in brackish water, and this affects the quality of the fruits. It makes the fruits a lot sweeter. It makes them slightly more acidic. And these two properties combined, the sweet and sour, is very attractive for the human palate. So these tomatoes really taste fantastic. They also have a slightly thicker skin. And some consumers don't like that. So it can be, you know, we have to get this right ourselves, and I think we have but um, the thicker skin, you need to get it so it's a little bit thicker, so it's not disliked by too many <laughs> consumers. But what it does do is really greatly enhance the shelf life of the plants, uh, of the fruits. And so this is, of course, greatly reducing um, of, of, of loss and waste um, in the food chain. So that's really a nice um, um, contribution. And the fourth property of these fruits that we have quite, quite unusual is uh, because they're growing in salt, the fruits, the plants respond by increasing their antioxidant levels inside the fruits to help protect the fruits against any further stress that might come to the plant. And those uh, in particular, it is increased vitamin C um, quantity. So, you know, we can get 50% higher vitamin C. So these fruits are not only environmentally good, but they taste good and they're good for you. Okay, all of this has been controlled by our control system called cortex, which is uh, the brain of our greenhouses. These are really important for our saltwater greenhouses and for greenhouses which are having to cope with higher temperatures outside than most other control systems, which are generally developed by um, in, in temperate climates, such as you would find in Northern Europe. So we do have a system with a lot of um, IoT and machine learning um, technologies. It's really coming of age quite nicely this. Very briefly introducing um, uh, the next step in the, in the company's development. We've developed these saltwater greenhouses. They are now being commercialized and it's um, looking good. But that's sort of just the start. We want to integrate these in systems where we're able to use salt water before it's used for cooling the greenhouse and after it has been used um, uh, for cooling the greenhouse. So we get more value, if you like, for the salt water that has been pumped. And we would like to integrate our greenhouses with systems uh, involving um, aquaculture, the, uh, the growing in, in ponds or tanks in greenhouses, believe it or not, cheap greenhouses uh, to, um, to grow fish, high value fish, 
Um, integrating that with open fields where we're growing some of those salt tolerant plants. There are some plants which grow in seawater and we have a whole research program here to domesticate them, to turn them from wild plants into crops that will have strong economic viability whilst using no, and I mean no, fresh water. We can then integrate those with algae uh, such as asparagopsis, which is an alga which when used as a food supplement to cattle greatly reduces the methane emissions from the cattle through our greenhouse and then the waste from the greenhouse, these systems produce a lot of waste. So for every kilogram of tomato, we will have at least two kilograms of waste. I don't mean bad waste, I mean plant waste, uh, leaves and stems and roots, things like that. They can be upcycled. Uh, they could be upcycled uh, by feeding to, for example, fly larvae, which then are very good for fish food, which goes back into our aquaculture system. So you can develop some circularity within the system. This is just a process flow diagram, which um, I'm going to, yes, just flick over this. This is an example of where we can start to develop um, circular systems uh, where the waste is integrated to generate fish food and uh, also integrated with the growing of salicornia in, um, in, in full seawater, seawater that the fish had previously been growing in. So you can get some quite nice um, circular systems developed where we're upcycling waste more than simply recycling it. That's simply a graphic uh, showing what we're doing. Our tomatoes are already being commercially um, produced. We're selling a ton a week, more than a ton a week of tomatoes and a couple of other products as well. We have nine products now in our, in our catalog and uh, they're liked, they are very well received. Uh, and uh, that's just a, a food influencer from one of her, her tweets. I think our work does align very well with both the Kingdom's Vision 2030 and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I think that's very important that business does work towards these um, goals of um, environmental sustainability, very, very important. So to conclude, Globally, we do need absolutely to increase the sustainability of our food system. We need to reduce the environmental footprint of our food system, and especially in the context in the Middle East, reduce the water footprint of our food production. On the other hand, we also need to improve the nutritional value of our food. And that is most effectively done by improving, increasing the availability of fresh fruit and vegetables to help address in particular those micronutrient deficiency challenges that really face a very large fraction of, um, of, of, of the humans on this, on this planet. And covered agricultural systems can address both of these issues and I think make significant contributions at a global scale to improving the sustainability of our food system and improving the nutritional value of our food. And that's the primary aim of Red Sea Farms to develop and deploy technologies to reduce the environmental footprint of both covered agricultural systems and in open fields as well. Thank you all very much. Wow, Mark, that was, that was, that was fascinating. That was absolutely fascinating. You, you, you put up a slide towards the end on the, um, on the actual uh, produce going going to going to local markets and stuff. So the reaction has been the reaction has been very favorable. Uh, yes, yes. We actually very early on we we're very sensitive to the consumer demand. As <laughs> I am an academic, I'm just a plant scientist. So I'm. I mean, it's very kind to invite me to leading entrepreneurs of the world. <laughs> I don't feel that I'm particularly a leading entrepreneur, but what I do recognize and did from before the start that you know, no market no business you know yeah, you have yeah. to have a market and so we actually did taste panels we actually paid money for a professional to run some tasting um, surveys of our of our um, pilot uh, produce before we went commercial and they were really useful actually very useful because people were going growing in seawater oh dirty that was what some people thought and that was their responses so we had to respect that and uh, talk about growing things in salt water rather than in seawater. 
And we also needed to get the right sorts of amounts of salt water. If you put too much salt water on, you make the skin too thick. You actually make the fruit a little bit too sweet. And we we're again, sensitive to those types of consumer demand. So we did that before the start. And then, um, and now, yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure we've still got lots of improvements, but I think we're generally heading in the right direction and they're very well received. You get, <laughs> I remember, we were, actually I won't tell the story, it's too long and too, too long-winded, but it is being very well received by, by distributors, by retailers, um, which is pretty important. And then it does seem to go off the, the shelves of the supermarket. We certainly haven't had any problems selling anything so far. How about the price point? How does it yeah. compare with some of the other, the other tra traditional type of produce? Yeah, that's really good. We had one guy um, uh, do, a, do a survey of, of, of what we had selected as what we thought was a price point the consumer would bear. Um, and then they did a really wide survey, much more than we did, where we went into a few supermarkets, went on a few websites. Um, and we, he found, actually really surprised us, he found that we were, um, when, you, when you plot all of the, all of the um, price range of materials, that we were about 40% from the top. So we were above average, but not far above average. I really looked at the data and actually, that I mean, that was good. So that was nice. But when you look at the volumes as well, you know, there's a really much higher volume um, at the cheaper end. And we're definitely well above average if you take not just the range of prices, but the volumes within each of those price segments. So we're at the moment, I mean, I, you have to admit we are in that top 20, 30 um, percent of the of the product range. But um, that's going to there's, 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 well, there's two things. <laughs> People eat a lot of tomatoes. You know, globally, it's 20 kilos per person per year. And, um, and in this region, it's 40 kilos on average. People eat a lot of tomatoes. And so it would take us many, many years and actually a couple of billion dollars to, before we start saturating even the top 20, 30% of the total market in this region. So I think we've got a fair bit of, you know, runway ahead of us before we really have to start moving our prices down. But it is inevitable that we will be able to move our prices down as we scale and become more efficient. I was very impressed with the, um, the UN slide. Uh, dear, dear friend of mine, we, we, we serve on the board of my college. He's actually a member of the UN Global Compact Boards. So I, I've seen I've seen that matrix before, and uh, trust me, when when this recording is available, uh, I'll be copying it and sending it to him in an email because I'm sure he'd be extremely interested in in, in your work. That's great. Uh, you know, Thank it, you very it's also much. interesting. My my wife would never let me shop for fruits or vegetables, right? And I I I looked at your website, and what I you know what I would what I would otherwise look to. To buy, it's always well. It's you know, it's got to be all the same color. I noticed on the website, it's that you said that the best tomatoes are green shouldered. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, what well, that's actually for um, some varieties of tomatoes. Not all tomatoes um, should be green shouldered at all. But there's traditionally here in Saudi Arabia a variety which is called Ramsey which has been grown actually on saline soils. It's a really tough tomato. It's very impressive. And it's grown on the, on the east, in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia on saline soils. Beautiful flavor, but it's got a really short shelf life. Um, it's, and it goes really soft. And so you have to pick it uh, when it's really just starting to turn. You have to sell it when it's still got green shoulders because two days later, it's game over. Um, so we're actually using that tomato for, I mean, we do, we do retail it a bit, but it's not profitable to be honest, but it's, uh, it's, it's certainly a, a traditional Saudi tomato, which the locals like. So that's that green shoulder comment was just for that variety. So it certainly yeah. sounds like from, from your map and, and some of the other things you, you talked about, a lot, of, a lot of innovation coming out of the university. I mean, it sounds like they, they're a tremendous partner for you. Uh, oh. Yeah, they're great. They're great. And um, the university is um, pleased. I mean, it's a young university. There's a huge investment from the kingdom. So there's a huge pressure on the university to not just 
publish papers in nature and do all that sort of stuff, but to also deliver real um, contributions to the kingdom. And the university does that. It does it at a policy level. Right. It does it through interactions with the majors, and it does it through um, entrepreneurial startup um, spin outs, startups. And uh, the university, what I like about the university is that it's, well, yeah, I said it, it doesn't just talk about it. It actually really very proactively um, uh, facilitates these startups. And we've had a really good ride with them. They've been very supportive. There's a, there's a good president who really recognizes the need and a very good vice president for innovation and economic development uh, who, yeah, has, well, they have resources, which is good, but they're really using the resources pretty intelligently as well. You know, you, you, see, you see that more and more universities kind of partnering with, with entrepreneurs, businesses, researchers, yeah. scientists. I mean, here in the States sometimes, uh, and this comes from just anecdotally from, from some of the college tours I used to do with my daughters, where you yes. would go and like one side of the campus would be all solar panels, for instance, because they had all this excess land and they were, as you said, you were kind of like making your own electricity back, you're, you're, you're producing. Yeah. So it's really coming coming back back full circle. Now, now in the Entrepreneurial World Cup, as you said, you finished third place out of 100,000. That's incredibly impressive. Yes. On, on the website, it said that uh, the Kirshner Group was kind of your mentor. And yes. you, didn't, you didn't mention them in the slides. I was just curious, um, how helpful have they been as part of the whole process? Yes, I, I was very remiss of me. My apologies, Kirshner Group. <laughs> yes, we actually have... Uh, it's, it's, we're growing so fast, we can't keep our slides up with uh, how it's going. It's really good. Kirsten, uh, actually, uh, they're being fantastic. Um, you know, when you, as I said, I'm just an academic. Ryan, my business partner, he's fantastic. He's more business wise than me. But even so, you know, we're just two guys. And um, to be able to get advice and support as well as networking and contacts. Kirshner have been really good at, at, several, at several levels. And uh, it's, you know, it's hard when you're a startup going through the valley of death and all of that. that that's sort of, everybody does that. But as you start to come out, it gets quite scary and you really need some wise heads and some, some people who have really seen it all before, especially when you've never done it before yourself. So then you're starting to try to make more intelligent or wiser decisions as you're coming out, because some of those decisions can be really big. Now that that makes that makes certainly perfect sense. And you know, and you and you talk about uh, despite you, know, you said you're a scientist and a research. I mean, you're 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 living this business. You 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 said you merged with the the, the solar glass company Iris, right? That yeah. that's that's obviously adding adding to everything that that you can do. Yes. helping you in your process and so you know from a you know there, there's a wonderful example of okay you're 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 in the business cycle here you're you're, you're you know you're yeah. merging with companies you're, you're looking at yeah. funding yeah. down the line as you said you've done yeah. some already uh yeah. and then looking 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 ahead as well you know one of the things they always talk about with sustainability um it's the triple bottom line right yes right people planet and profit mm. um certainly yeah. certainly the first two p's at the moment, you guys, you guys are you're, you guys are acing that, and as as the as you grow to scale, as you said, the, that yes. last P will certainly certainly come come online as well as as you continue to to, to, to build build these these greenhouses and, and drive the technology into yes. a commercial into a commercial market, right? Yes, it's yes. Just really fa really fascinating. You know, I, I grew up uh, here in the in the states. There was a television show in the in the late in the mid mid to late sixties. Called Lost in Space, right? And they always yes, talked. I about, remember that, right? They always talked about the, you know, the uh, the hydroponic garden, right? And <laughs> doing all of this with nothing. And then I was looking at your website and say, like, hey, wait, there's the, there's the word hydroponic. Oh my goodness, that's fantastic. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. That's yeah, here, here <laughs> I used to watch so that as a kid. <laughs> so you've taken what used to be science fiction and you're and you're rolling uh, it out. You're rolling it out to to everyone. I mean, it's amazing. It really is a fascinating. True. That's really nice. Experience. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think we're sort of at the stage where we can talk about developing systems where we're using sun, sea, and sand, and I, I think we're pretty close to that now. Yeah, no, it's 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 an amazing story. So listen, Mark, thank you for spending time with us today and and telling telling the Red Sea story. It's 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 a fascinating fascinating uh, business model. Congratulations to you and your partner on on all of your great works. And as as you build 
that sustainable model. Th thank you for for the population. You're, you're taking issues <laughs> such as water scarcity, um, you know, and, and 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 sustainable produce and and bringing it to everyone. And that and that's incredibly admirable. Uh, and congratulations on everything. So yes, thank you for being part of leading entrepreneurs of the world. Absolutely, without a doubt. Uh, we wish you continued success in the future uh, and look forward to continuing our dialogue with you. And if we can be helpful to you and your partner as you go forward, please, please, please call on us. Thank you very much, Glenn. Thank you for your words. And uh, as I say, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to speak on this fantastic My, platform. Our pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Have a great, great evening on your part of the world and best to you and your family and your company. Take good care. Thanks so much, Glenn. Appreciate Thank it. You.